a few weeks ago, this crazy story about Wells Fargo closing down all its lines of credit came out and it shocked an awful lot of people. People who had taken on debt from Wells Fargo were without warning told that the bank would be cancelling their accounts in 60 days and that their previous agreements for repayments and interest rates were void. To make matters even worse, those who had lines of credit with Wells Fargo will see their credit ratings fall as a result of Wells Fargo's actions. Unfortunately, in the following few weeks, the news hasn't really got any better. Tesco Bank, based out of the UK, just announced that they will be closing 213,000 bank accounts and that their customers will have to go and open up a new account somewhere else. Which we will own nothing and we will be happy. New data for the Mortgage Credit Availability Index has come out and it shows that it's been getting harder and harder to get a mortgage or any kind of credit and it's going to get even worse. Our media is telling us that the economy is booming, the stock market's up record amounts, the housing market's up record amounts, and we have fully recovered from the pandemic and the lockdowns over the last year. But the market is telling us that this isn't the case. A credit crunch even larger than the one we saw in 2008 could be on its way. And what lots of the banks are doing only makes that possibility seem even more likely. Today, I'm going to explain what these banks have been doing, why they're doing this, and how this could impact us. So just a few weeks ago, we started seeing articles like this one from CNBC, reacting to the decision by Wells Fargo to stop giving out new lines of credit and to cancel those that they've already given out. Now these lines of credit were typically used to consolidate higher interest loans or credit card debt or to pay for home renovations. They ranged from $3,000 all the way up to $100,000, but all of a sudden they would all be canceled. Now, Wells Fargo CEO Charles Scharf said that this was to allow the business to concentrate more on credit cards. But the reality is that Wells Fargo are a struggling business and have been hit much harder than most other banks over the last year or so. In 2018, news broke that Wells Fargo was allowing millions of unauthorized bank accounts to be opened up and for debt to be piled onto people without their knowledge. Now, this had been happening since as early as 2002, but Wells Fargo had just ignored it because it was making them money. They were fined over $140 million and had an asset cap placed on them which forced them to rebalance their books so that they were compliant with the law again. This asset cap basically cost the bank billions of dollars in lost earnings, but also cost Wells Fargo's customers. They had cancelled home equity lines of credit known as HELOCs, car loans, and now personal lines of credit as well, all in preparation for shaky market conditions which we will own nothing and we will be happy. There's no doubt that Wells Fargo are preparing for a credit crunch, a market crash, sustained inflation or higher interest rates, but they're not the only bank taking drastic measures. Last week in the UK, Tesco Bank announced that they will be closing all 213,000 of their current accounts and that all of their customers will have to move to a competitor. Tesco claimed that this was to concentrate on the parts of their business that best meet the needs of their customers, but the reality is probably far more worrying. This is happening at a time when no one really expected it. From the news that the world's governments and central banks are giving out, you would expect banks to be trying to expand their offerings to get more customers, not to run them off and refuse to do business with them. Perhaps Tesco are expecting the markets to take a turn for the worse. As already discussed, they wouldn't be the only bank preparing for a credit crunch. Now, onto the Mortgage Credit Availability Index. Now, this is essentially a measure of how easy or difficult it is to get a mortgage or a line of credit. The higher the measure, the easier it is to get a loan, and the lower it is, the harder it is to get a loan. Looking at the data, we can see very clearly that it has gotten far harder to find a mortgage over the last year, and it seems like it's going to keep getting harder as well. In the early 2010s, when the world was still reeling from the housing market crash and was in the middle of the credit crunch, it was very difficult to get a mortgage or a loan. The banks required you to have a good down payment, a good credit score, a good history of paying down your debt, and a regular and high income that would easily cover any repayments. This was because the banks were afraid of lending out too much money on homes or assets that weren't worth what they thought they were and to people who couldn't pay them off, which is exactly what happened in 2008. But as the economy started to move again, as people got wealthier and the housing market recovered, the banks got more comfortable lending money again. The requirements loosened and people bought more homes. People took out more loans for cars or for home improvements. You can see very clearly the index rising from 2014 and onwards as it gets easier and easier to acquire debt. But then in 2020, the world shut down and the index collapsed. 
Almost overnight, every bank in the world thought a market crash was imminent and they tightened their lending policies. They stopped giving out loans as they were afraid that no one would be able to pay them off. They were afraid that the assets they were backed against would collapse in value. This is shown very clearly by the sharp and almost instant decline in the index. But that crash never came and the market stabilized and bit by bit, the credit policy of banks all over the world started to loosen up again. That was until the last couple of months. With the threat of a stronger and deadlier Delta variant of the virus, rising inflation and rising unemployment, the index plummeted once more. Now you can see very clearly how sharp this drop was and the truth is that no one knows how long the index will continue to drop for. But what this does tell us is that the article about Wells Fargo closing lines of credit or Tesco cancelling 213,000 current accounts or JP Morgan hoarding $500 billion of cash are not just outliers that are making the headlines, they are representative of the credit market tightening across the board. This is starting to look an awful lot like the banks are predicting a market crash and a double dip recession. So what are the banks afraid of? What is causing them to tighten their lending policy and to stop taking the huge profits that come with lending money? Well, the sad reality is that there are a bunch of things that are spooking the markets right now, and it's very difficult to know which ones the banks are worried about. The most obvious threat is the end of the eviction and foreclosure moratoriums that are in place not only in the United States, but in countless other countries around the world as well. Essentially, governments saw that millions of people were unable to pay their rent or their mortgage payments when the economy was shut down and people were prevented from working. In order to stop millions from losing their homes, the government simply made it illegal to evict tenants or to foreclose on homes. Now, in the short term, this worked. It meant that the housing market wasn't flooded with supply and prices didn't collapse like we saw in 2008. It meant that the rental market wasn't oversaturated and there weren't millions of families forced out onto the street. But it didn't solve the problem. It merely pushed the burden onto someone else's shoulders. Those who haven't made any repayments on their home over the last year will at some point need to be foreclosed on. And those who haven't paid the rent over the last year will at some point need to be evicted. When the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures end, the crash that the government claimed to have avoided will arrive regardless of what anyone says. Banks are scared of what this could do and it echoes of the crash of 2008. Home prices could plummet and banks could be unable to get the money they are owed. They may be forced to sell homes at 30, 40 or even 50% discounts just to recover some of their capital. But that's not the only thing that banks are afraid of. Inflation is high right now, like really high. Higher than we have seen in years and it seems to be getting worse, not better. For pretty much all of 2021, the Fed and Jerome Powell have been telling us to ignore the data and to trust them that inflation is transitory and it's not worth worrying about. But so far, the Fed has been wrong. They have consistently underestimated inflation and have failed to meet a single target this year. Those who used to believe everything the Fed told them, like meet Kevin, have now started considering the possibility that inflation is actually here to stay. And for a bank, inflation is not a good thing. Inflation erodes away debt and is great for those who have picked up too much debt, but it is a killer to banks and those who lend. This could be one of the reasons banks around the world are reluctant to lend. Interest rates are low and inflation rates are high. When a bank gives you a 2% loan on a house, in real terms, they are losing money. Lots of people are looking at the bond markets to try and confirm their belief that the inflation is transitory, but perhaps they should be looking to the credit markets instead. Finally, we need to look at the possibility that we've been living in a phony bull run over the last year. Now I know I don't need to tell you how well stocks have done, how well the housing market has done, and how high GDP growth has been over the last year. But the reality could be that this is all just a spike before the crash, and we could enter what's called a double dip recession. The GDP of most countries in the world is still below their pre-COVID levels, yet the stock markets are up 40%. The companies that make up those markets are by and large still below their revenue and profit figures from before the lockdown started, yet their market caps have all increased. The housing market is soaring, but it's propped up by ridiculously low interest rates that have nowhere to go but up. Unemployment figures in the United States have stopped falling and are actually rising again looking into the data behind our economies and it quickly becomes clear that things aren't as great as Biden and Jerome Powell are telling us they are. 
So the question on everyone's mind seems to be, what can we do? And the answer is surprisingly simple. We should be doing what we should always be doing. We should avoid taking on any unnecessary or high interest debt. We should be making concerted efforts to pay off any high interest debt that we don't need. We should be living within our means and ensuring that we have a solid emergency fund just in case. We should avoid overpaying for homes when we already have a perfectly fine place to live. We should be aware that the government can't delay the inevitable forever and that at some point there will be another crash, but that as long as we aren't trapped in a vicious debt cycle, we will be okay. So what does it mean in practice? Five things, five priorities. So first one is we have to redefine our social contract to integrate, more inclusion. Um, we also have to make sure that we integrate much more in a social contract our responsibility towards the next generation. We cannot just think of the debt, leave all the solutions and uh, to be paid for by the next generation. Um, so the social contract and in the social contract we also have to look at one specific issue. Um, so uh, COVID will create again a gap between the so-called industrialized and emerging countries. Uh, the emerging countries, at least some of them, suffering much more uh, compared to some of the countries which have a well-established uh, social uh, safety net. Uh, all those technologies are very much advanced now by COVID. Uh, everything will be digitalized, which can be digitalized. So, finally, what is the role of um, uh, companies in this new um, post-COVID era? I think we are moving from short term to long term, from um, shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Uh, the COVID uh, crisis has shown that companies who invest into their vitality instead of prioritizing short-term profits, have performed much better. And that's what the stakeholders will expect in the future. Uh, the need for much stronger global cooperation. Uh, COVID has shown us that we are globally interdependent, and I think it's a wake-up call uh, to work in the future together uh, to address all the consequences and to create a reset in our economic, social, ecological thinking.